So uh, last time we discussed the difference between networks and groups, and we saw and we understood that the key difference, of course, is that in addition to the constituent individuals, a network has ties, uh, specific uh, ties between individuals and a specific number of ties. We saw evidence for spreading processes in networks for all kinds of phenomena using both observational and uh, experimental data. And we examined some of the possible explanations for correlations and attributes across connected individuals, considering the idea of induction uh, or social contagion, the idea of homophily or love of like or birds of a feather flock together, and the idea of context or confounding, all three of which might be underlying social processes that contribute to individuals who are connected evincing or sharing a similar traits. And today we're going to be doing two things. We're going to be shifting gears a little bit and talking about online networks for the first half of the class. And for the second half of the class, we're also going to be talking about some of the deeper sort of evolutionary origins for human social uh, networks. Uh, so trying to understand how, how deeply can we get and understand what are some of the biological, uh, genetic, uh, psychological, sociological, and mathematical principles that undergird human social network uh, creation and the, and the structure and function of networks that are seen so diversely. So last time we talked about how things spread online, and the question is, well, do things spread online as well? And does the online world resemble the offline world, or how is it different? And what, in fact, if anything, does the internet offer? To what extent does the internet represent some novel form of human social interaction? And how does it extend or exploit some ancient proclivities we have to form social networks? and to be interested in influencing other people and learning uh, from other people or being influenced by them or having them learn uh, from us. And one of the things that we argue about, uh, argue for in, in Connected in the readings for today is that there are actually ways in which the online networks are the same, some deep fundamental functions of networks that are not affected by the fact that we've taken them online, and certain other things that are different. And they're the same insofar as they give um, give form to this very fundamental desire that human beings have for connection. And they're the same in the extent to which they also give opportunity or form to the ability that we humans have to interact with each other and affect each other. So connection and contagion, the structure of the network and the function of the network, uh, are, this, uh, are evinced online to be as much, if not more, or not more, but equally as, uh, as in face-to-face -face networks. But there are certain things which are indeed different. And we outlined four different ways in which online networks can be seen as different from offline networks. The first is this idea of enormity. The scale of online interactions, the medium, the internet medium, provides an opportunity for a scale of interaction that far exceeds the capacity or the scale that we might have in face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. Uh, now, some of you might think, and I'll come back to this point later, some of you might think that, well, in the olden days, they had very few friends. And now, with Facebook, we have many friends. And I actually think that's total crap. Uh, that, in fact, what's happened is, is that a very old and fundamental and important lang a word in our language, namely friends, has come to be applied where it has no business. Those thousand Facebook friends of yours are not friends of yours. Some, frankly, they're not even acquaintances. Most of the time, you don't even know who they are. Uh, and so, and, but we use the term now. We've expanded the use of the term to apply where it doesn't matter. But nevertheless, this technology allows us a kind of social interaction, a staying in, connection, uh, in touch with uh, people who we previously were not so in touch with, so enormity. Another idea is communality. So human beings could always band together to achieve certain collective objectives. You guys could cooperate to go kill uh, a, a large game of prey, for example. Or you could cooperate with each other to teach each other some kind of a skill. But now this medium, the online medium, provides an opportunity for communal, communality, a kind of shared contribution to a common good that exceeds what we used to have before. And so a classic example is Wikipedia. Each person contributing a little bit of knowledge, sometimes right, sometimes wrong, can create a whole that's accurate. So the Wikipedia entries can actually be very, very accurate, even though each person only has partial information. So just like flocks of birds or schools of fish may come together to achieve certain objectives in navigation, for example, or in avoiding predators, human beings can use this online technology now to interact on a scale that far exceeds the kinds of scales we previously were able to, uh, to interact with, coming out. Specificity is another way the online world has changed, changed the kind of social interactions. 
In the olden days, if you wanted to find a Norwegian uh, army veterinarian, this was not an easy thing to do. But now, you guys can just click online, you can search for someone like that, and probably within a little bit of time, find such an individual. So this specificity is another way in which, and also as we discuss in Connected, there are ways in which individuals, like-minded individuals, can find each other. So in the olden days, if, as we talk about these, this gang-stalking uh, phenomenon that was discussed in the, in the book, individuals who had this paranoid delusion that they were being monitored 24-7 by the United States government, individuals like that in the past would feel very isolated. But now online, they can go online and very quickly find someone who has a similar uh, kind of ideology and form a group. Or, and this can be both good and bad, right? So it can be bad insofar as it reinforces bad behavior, but it can be good insofar as it offers opportunities for social connection to individuals who previously felt quite isolated. Some of you must be familiar with the idea of cutting behavior that's often shown in adolescents. And cutting behavior, there are like forums online for people to talk about cutting. Now, on the one hand, those forums could be really effective at reducing the behavior. On the other hand, you can see really crazy kind of stuff, as we discuss in the book, where people encourage each other to engage in the behavior. So specificity. And the fourth idea is virtuality. Now, it was always possible for human beings to pretend to be someone who they were not. And in fact, as most of you know, like there's a long history of kind of self-adornment, where people change their attire, change their hair color, tattoo themselves, and change the kind of cosmetics that they use to appear to be something different than they are. People always have been interested in changing their appearance. People have always been able to pass as someone who are there or not. But with the online world, it's much easier to do this. So for example, it's much easier to change your gender online than it is to change it in real life. So virtuality is another uh, kind of way in which online social interactions are different than face-to-face -face interactions. And here's some fascinating photographs by a photographer by the name of Rodney Cooper of real people who he tracked down paired with their online avatars. So here is a, here's a, a guy, I think he's in Germany or in Switzerland, and here's the online avatar that he's chosen uh, for himself. So here it's much easier for him to pass as this woman uh, than, 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 than it would in real life to you know, don this type of attire and look like, like her. Um, and and there were always, it was always possible to, to cross genders and change your appearance in this regard, but of course it's much easier to do so online. Or the disabled can pass as the able-bodied. And this is one of the more haunting images of Cooper's uh, series. This, of course, shows a very uh, severely paralyzed boy. He's probably paralyzed at the level of the neck. He even has a device that helps him breathe. And look how poignantly, look at the avatar that this young man picks for himself, right? Like a kind of an impervious, strong uh, avatar who's like immune to uh, fates and the kind of adversity that might occur in the world. So it's easy to imagine why why he would pick such an avatar. And to me, at least, this is a very powerful and poignant uh, contrast. So let's take a look at the issue of scale of networks, the kind of issue of enormity that we uh, also put on the table. This is a natural social network of 105 close friends uh, in a college dorm. So it might be, for example, a set of buildings in, uh, in Silliman, or a set of buildings adjoining ent entryways in Stiles, for example. Uh, and and so here, uh, here's every dot's a person, and every line represents a relationship between the two people, and the white lines show who's whose friend uh, in, this, uh, in these college students. And on average, these college students have six and a half really good friends, like close friends, on average. This guy here uh, might have only one friend, this person has four friends, this person has two, but some of these others have more, and it varies. There's a distribution in the number of friends uh, that people have. On average, they have about six and a half close friends. And here's what happens when we add in the green lines whether they're members of the same ethnically based club. So the green lines connect individuals who are members of the same uh, club. And here's what happens if we add who's whose roommates in blue. Uh, some of these are concerning phenomena. So for example, these individuals here are roommates with each other, but they're not friends with each other, a phenomenon I'm sure you guys are unfamiliar with. Uh, and and that can create certain kinds of problems, and it's discussed in the book. It's the notion of multiplexity in networks, that you have different interactions with uh, different people. And here, for example, you could be the roommate, yes or no. You could be a friend, yes or no, and so forth. And here's what happens when you add Facebook friendships. On average, people have 110. In the time we did this particular project, so that was years ago. Uh, now the numbers are higher. Uh, people had 110 Facebook friends, even though they only had about six and a half uh, real friends. 
And here's what happens when you expand to the whole college class, not just one particular dormitory of 1,700 students. You get this incredible complexity, this big you know, pile of spaghetti, 1,700 yellow dots, and all the kind of blue, green, white, and red lines connecting uh, the individuals to each other. And this profusion of data can be overwhelming. So both for analytical and for conceptual reasons, we need some kind of a way to discern who is who's real friend in all of this uh, noise, in all of this profusion of online interactions. Because Facebook friends and other sorts of online connections can actually be very tenuous. And they may be so tenuous that we might legitimately argue or ask, do they influence us in the same way that face-to-face -face interactions do? Can you be affected by online networks in the kinds of ways you can be affected by face-to-face -face networks that we discussed uh, at the last lecture? So one of the ideas we had, at least in this initial project, was that in order to discern who were your real friends from among your Facebook friends, is we developed this sort of picture friends method. Now, when we did this about 10 years ago now, or eight years ago now, we actually had to do it manually. Now you could automate the procedure. So we went to people's Facebook pages. This was also when Facebook had no privacy settings. And, uh, and we looked at people's photographs and who was tagged in the photograph. And we made the argument that if you took a picture with him and went, first of all, you were in the same place. You got someone else to take a picture of you because you thought it was important. And then you went home and you uploaded it to your Facebook page and then tagged it, that actually that relationship was more important than than your relationship with him where you don't even know who he is, or if you do, you certainly wouldn't bother to take a photograph and upload it onto your Facebook page. So we said if people co-appeared in a photograph, and we further did some stuff like restrict it so it's not like group photographs of 20 people, right? Like that, you know, you're in uh, some kind of uh, event, that doesn't count. It has to be a small number of people that says there's some special relationship. And when we did that, we found that on average, people had about six and a half real friends uh, <coughs> embedded within all of these Facebook friends. And it turns out that tenuous Facebook friendships and similar internet connections do not have the same influence as face-to-face -face friendships. And so we thought we would study whether any old Facebook friend could influence your taste in music or movies or in books, for example. And we found that they could not. If one of your Facebook friends expresses an interest in a movie or some music or a book, it, doesn't affect the pro it does not affect the probability that at some future time point you will have a similar interest. On the other hand, when we looked at your picture friends, if one of your picture friends expresses an interest in one of those things, it does affect you. So for example, here are the top 10 movies in this college age population, uh, from Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Gladiator, down to Shawshank uh, Redemption. And what we found is that if one of your picture friends expresses an interest in one of these movies, uh, it affects you, but only for these three movies. Uh, Good Will Hunting, uh, Pulp Fiction, and Love Action. So if one of your friends says, oh, I like a certain movie, it might affect the probability that you will express an interest in that movie uh, in the future. And when we mapped the network, uh, we found that it was actually quite polarized. So these are college student networks. The Love Actually fans are in yellow. The Pulp Fiction fans are in red. There are very few fans of both movies. They're in orange. And you can see a kind of cluster of Pulp Fiction fans here and of uh, Love Actually fans here. And the two orange dots, the guys that like, like both movies, which I was one of them, uh, are right on the border, structurally on the border between the two uh, populations. Okay? Now, the, the, um, and one of the things to recognize from when we look at this image is to begin to gather or to glean or to reinforce an idea we introduced the last time, which is that different positions within a network are different. They have different structural locations. So there's a, there's a middle of the network, and then there's an edge of the network. And here what we're saying is that the Pulp Fiction fans seem to be more likely to be located in the middle of the network, and the Love Actually fans are more likely to be located on the periphery of the network, uh, for example. Now, businesses and policymakers and global health experts, and I'll show you some results next time about this, often seem to think that if in order to target influential people, what they really need to do is find people with the most connections, for instance, people in the middle of the network. But what this type of analysis suggests is that it's not enough to know where people are in the network. You need to know something else about them as well. So for example, if you're selling a love actually, and you target these people, you're going to be out of luck. It's not going to work. Those people are Pulp Fiction fans. They're not going to be interested uh, in that movie. Now, a few years ago, uh, my co-author James Fowler and I were reminded of this distinction between real influential ties and more tenuous ones ourselves. Now, who knows who Alyssa Milano is? 
So it's de declining every day. She like peaked like a few years ago. It's like who saw who's the boss when they were young? You guys all missed it, right? So this was, you. some of you did? Raise your hands if you know who Alyssa Milano is. Okay, so some of you know. She's a moderately well-known actress. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, she has about a million uh, 50,000 Twitter followers. And a few years ago, very unexpectedly, she tweeted a link to our book, Connected to Surprising Powers <laughs> and How They Shape Our Lives. And in the, in the tweet was a link. If you click on this link, it goes right to the Amazon.com website for our book. So you click on this link, and you go right to the Amazon.com website for our book. And on this particular day when she sent this tweet, we did not know who Alyssa Milano was. Uh, she tweeted it to her million followers. It was retweeted about a million times. Two million people got a tweet with a link to our book on the Amazon.com website. And James and I, because we're neurotic, follow the sales rank of our book, <laughs> or at least we did at the time. So here on the y-axis is the sales rank. Here is selling more books. Here is selling fewer books. Here is Ms. Milano uh, looking at the trajectory. <laughs> Here's the date. Here's the date at which she tweeted our book, and here is the day she tweeted our book. <laughs> we estimate that we did not sell a single extra copy of the book. Despite two million people getting a tweet about our book on that particular day, we estimate we did not sell not a one extra copy uh, compared to the baseline. And in fact, some people looking at these data have said that actually when Milano tweeted our book, people rushed to the bookstores to return our book, which, which explains the decline uh, in, uh, in, in uh, things. So this, this helps illustrate, this is just an anecdote, it's not a scientific experiment, but it helps illustrate the point that these weak online connections may not evince or, dis, or have the same property of high impact influence. Now among Milano's million followers, they're probably her sister, her best friend, and her mother, who if they were watching her Twitter feed, might have said, oh, Alyssa likes this book, and they would have gone to buy it. So online networks can be very, very effective, and we may come back to the issue of the Arab Spring at some point, can be very, very effective at disseminating information, but not so effective at disseminating behavior change, and we'll come back to this. Yeah, because in fact, we're coming back to it right now, uh, online networks can facilitate these types of interactions on a vast scale, but as we have seen, influence for many processes appears to still depend on real face-to-face -face interactions. So if we're going to actually take advantage of the online world to begin to intervene in the world to change people's behavior, we're going to need some way of quantifying what is a meaningful interaction online. We're going to have to figure out which interactions represent real relationships whereby influence might possibly be exerted. So we're going to need to understand we're going to need, if you're going to use online networks to affect human behavior, the interactions must be real or feel real. You have to design user interfaces or technologies that make them seem as if they really are your friends, these people, even though they are not. Or you have to consider the idea that something must be at stake. It's possible for you to be affected uh, by people you don't know online if you come to the venue with a common purpose. So for example, if you're looking for a sexual partner, or if you are both smokers and you want to quit smoking, and you go to an online smoking cessation website, and you get support from people who want to quit smoking, or if you have a cancer patient and you want uh, information about side effects of chemotherapy and you listen to someone else even though you don't know them because they have your kind of cancer and you and they have a common interest in understanding how this chemotherapy works. Or if you're looking to transact business, you want to use Craigslist to sell something or buy something, then you can be affected by it when something is actually at stake. And lastly, one of the things that's sort of very important if you're going to think about how to exploit online networks to affect human behavior is to recognize that it's not enough to focus your obsessive attention onto who are the leaders, but also you must identify who are the followers. Because we don't just need shepherds, we need sheep. If you're really gonna take advantage of online networks, you have to understand, okay, who, if they change their behavior, will affect who? Who are the people around this person that actually will move with that person when you begin to target them to manifest behavior change? So we need ways to cultivate an authentic feel in online interactions and in real connections if those were not there to begin with. Um, and so these are three basic principles about how to exploit online network interactions and try to move some of the stuff that we've seen in the offline world into the online world. Smoking cessation I mentioned already. Here's one example. This is data from Nate Cobb's work from a few years ago using, um, I forgot how many hundreds of thousands, but this is just about 10,000 smokers. 
These people had signed up online. Every dot is a person. The red guys are smokers. The blue guys are non-smokers. And the green lies are, lines are closer connections. And the purple lines are looser ties. This is 7,500 people in 2007. And if you look here, you can see clusters of blue and red dots, clusters of smokers and non-smokers. And the question is, as smokers join this, the, gr the group, who do you introduce them to and how to get them to copy the non-smokers and sustain their, uh, their smoking cessation uh, behavior? And this study suggests that certain kinds and amounts of online interactions may be more uh, important and more conducive to quitting uh, than others. Incidentally, we've also found, we've also used online networks uh, of picture friends in another way. So for example, uh, the same data set that we used to look at movies, uh, James and I decided that we would go back and look at the project that I presented to you the last time on emotional contagion to see whether we could find evidence for emotional contagion online. And initially what we did is, is we coded whether people were smiling in their profile pictures. So some people uh, were not smiling in their profile pictures from those days. They were kind of frowning. And some people were, had big smiles on their face. Uh, if you guys, you know, guys don't know James, but he's a big kind of open guy. Uh, and these were our profile pictures from the time we did this project. Uh, and uh, and we, colored, we colored the people who had smiley profile pictures as yellow and people who had frowny profile pictures as blue and otherwise uh, as green. And then we mapped the pictures on the network. And once again, you can see clusters of, of frowners and smilers uh, in the network. And actually, what we found is, is that the people with smiling profile pictures had 20% more friends than people with frowny uh, profile pictures. And we also found that the smiley people were more likely to be located in the center of the network, kind of where earlier we saw the Pulp Fiction fans were. And the frowny people are more likely to be located on the periphery of the network, again, structurally in a similar location to where we saw the Love Actually fans. So once again, there are different structural locations within the network. And this, this sort of online use of the uh, profile photographs triangulates with the work that we did and I presented last week on face-to-face -face interactions and emotional states of happiness. Now in another paper that we published more recently where we used vast amounts of information, what we did in this situation is, is we, took, we looked at uh, hundreds of millions of Facebook users and we said, what we really want is a natural experiment. Like, what I would really like to do is make you miserably unhappy. I would love to do that. And then, uh, and then see how, whether your friends, uh, maybe your Facebook friends, maybe your picture friends, your real friends, embedded within your Facebook friends, do they become unhappy as well, right? That's what we're trying to see. We're trying to find evidence for emotional contagion online. Now, obviously, I uh, don't easily, I can't experiment and go and make people miserably unhappy. But what we decided to do was the following idea, was to take advantage of a natural experiment, which is that it is in fact the case that when the weather is bad, people are more likely to be unhappy. And when they're unhappy, they're more likely to post negative uh, Facebook posts. So what we did is, is looking at the entire United States, we connected people to their friends in other cities who had different weather than the people in the index city. So we looked at you on days when it was raining, and we compared the kind of posts you made on days when it was raining to your friends who are not in the same city as you, outside your city, who are experiencing different weather, not rainy weather. And we saw how the rain, which changed your, uh, this is work by others, which we confirmed, the rain changed your attitude. Did that change in attitude caused experimentally now by the rain affect not only your own expression, but ripple through the network and affect the emotional expression of other individuals to whom you were connected. So we took advantage of this natural experiment that weather affects people's uh, emotional state and could we see evidence in the network of cascade effects uh, through the graph. And what we found was it's just that, and then we used natural language processing to look at people's Facebook posts to process the emotional content of millions and millions of posts. And what we found was is that actually there was evidence of emotional contagion. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, an average rainy day decreases the number of positive posts by 1% and increases the number of negative posts also by about 1%. And in addition to that, we found that each additional positive post yields an additional 1.75 positive posts amongst people's friends. This is at the margin. This is additional posts above and beyond the positive posts they otherwise would have evinced. Meanwhile, each additional negative post yields 1.29 more negative posts by one's friends. So we found an effect of positive posts increasing positive posts and negative posts increasing negative posts, which is what you would expect if there were emotional contagion. 
And then we found a converse that positive posts decrease negative posts and negative posts decrease positive posts, all four of which would be the kinds of things you would predict to occur if emotional contagion not only were real, but also taking place online, here measured just by what the kind of Facebook posts that people uh, post. Now, this work, is that clear? Is that experiment clear? Yeah, what's your name? Sukriti. Sukriti. Yeah. Um, so, were these posts, did they have to deal with the weather? No, they didn't have to deal with the weather. So, so you, how was it possible to know that it was the weather that was influencing the test? So we couldn't know that at your individual level it was, but we could look across time at you, and we could see what happens to you on, what kind of posts do you and everyone else in your city post on rainy days, and how does that compare to the content of the posts amongst you and all everyone else in the city on sunny days? And what we find first order, so at the first order we find that when it's rainy, people post more miserable posts. And when it's sunny, they post happier posts. And, and, and that, I mean, that just confirmed work that other people had done before, and, and that is common sense, that people are affected by the weather. That wasn't what we were interested in. What we were interested in is using the weather as a kind of natural experiment to test our interest in social contagion. So we wanted them, like the example I gave, I wanted to make him miserable. I can't obviously go and do that, but I can wait until the weather makes him miserable and then track his friends. And the friends of his we needed to track are specifically friends that are not in the same city. Otherwise, it's just context, right? It's the weather making him and his friends miserable. It's not social contagion. Remember how we talked about that the last time? We need to find friends of his that are in different cities that have different weather conditions, and then see how artificially manipulating his mood by the weather affects the mood expression of his friends who never saw the weather. So it's a kind of natural experiment. Is that clear? Other questions? Now, this work with emotions and with altruism, which uh, we reviewed last time, I showed you the kind of spread of altruistic behavior in networks, both of which are so fundamental, got us to thinking about the evolutionary basis of networks themselves. So human social networks, whenever they have been mapped, always look strikingly similar. They always look like the pictures that I've been showing uh, you so far, but they never look like this. No one has ever gone out to the world and mapped a naturally occurring human social network and found a regular lattice or something looking like a sodium chloride crystal in three-dimensional space. Why not? I mean, why don't we go out into the world and observe this incredible pheno natural phenomenon that is social networks, and when we go there, we map it and we find a regular lattice? Well, the striking pattern of human social networks, their ubiquity, and their apparent purpose begs the question of whether we evolved to have, we humans evolved to have, uh, social networks and to have social networks with a particular topology, with a particular structure. So the question now becomes, why do we form networks in the first place and why do they have the structure that they do? And in order to understand this, we have to dissect network structure a little bit first. So first of all, notice that every position in this network is isomorphic to every other position. So everyone has eight friends and every one of their friends has eight friends. And if I took this surface and wrapped it around a sphere, actually more properly if I wrapped it around a torus, a donut shape in three dimensions, every position would be equally peripheral as to every other position. Every position would have eight friends, every other position would have eight friends, all of your friends would be equally connected, and each of you would be as far from the edge as everyone else if you took this surface and wrapped it around the surface of a sphere, uh, of a torus, okay? And so I'm gonna shift now to, to talking to you a little bit about some of the deep evolutionary origins of human networks. But that's not what we see. We don't see that. In fact, we see this type of network, which is a real network. And in real networks, different people have different locations. And there are at least there are a number of ways, I'm gonna introduce three now, three basic ways you can characterize the location that people have within networks. So first look at node B and node D. Node B has four connections. And node D has six connections, six friendships. These are college students and who their real friends are. And this is known as the degree of a node. And most people know this about themselves. You have 10 friends. You have three friends. I have no friends. People know this about themselves, and they can be aware of the degree, OK? But now look at nodes C and D. C has six connections, and D has six connections. And this might be the limit of understanding that these individuals have about their social experience. Each of them may say, I have six connections. But we, with this bird's eye view, can see that C and D are actually very different. 
And I can cultivate this intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ like Ebola was spreading through the network? C or D? D. D. You have the intuition that it's better to be D. He or she's on the periphery of the network is going to be less likely to get whatever is spreading uh, and less likely to get it early in the course of the epidemic. Now, who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? C. You have the intuition that C is going to be more likely to be in the middle of the network. And this is, known as eigenve this is known as the centrality of a node. You can quantify this mathematically. And there are different sorts of ways you can quantify this. You can use something known as eigenvector centrality. You can use something known as uh, between the centrality, which is a really cool intuition. And what between the centrality does is it says, pick every node and trace out the shortest path between this node and every other node. So the shortest path between this node and this node is that. And the shortest path between this node and this node is this path. You can also go bang, 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 bang together, but that's a long path. That's not a short path. So this is the shortest path. It's from here to here. And the shortest path from this node to this node is bang, 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 to get from this path to this path. So you trace out for each node its shortest path to every other node. And you track all of those paths. And then you ask which nodes in the network are on the largest number of paths. The node that's on the largest number of paths is the node that is, in some sense, the most central. Anything moving through the network from one person to another is going to be more likely to pass through that node than any other. Do you see the intuition? So that's the between the centrality, or one of the ways in which the centrality of a node is different than the degree of a node. Now look at nodes B and A. B has four connections, and A has four connections. But the difference between the two is that a friend of a friend of A's is back again a friend of A's, whereas a friend of a friend of B's is not a friend of B's. This is known as the transitivity of a node, or the triadic closure, the likelihood that any two of your friends are friends with each other. So A's friends are friends with each other, and B's friends are not friends with each other. Now, if you were a prehistoric human, and the challenge was to go out and work together to kill a mastodon, who would you rather be, A or B? A, because you and your buddies can work together, co cohere together, go out and kill the damn thing. Now, who would you rather be if the challenge was not to, uh, to kill a mastodon, but rather to find a mastodon? B. B. Good. That's really good. Yeah. Classic <laughs> undergraduate, uh, you know, uh, uh, test-taking ability. You know, it's like, <laughs> I think you could have answered that even exactly. So, yeah, so B. That's right. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? Justin. Justin, that's, that's nice work, Justin. So he, now be, Justin, can you explain why? Um, because you don't want your friends to be applying the same app. OK, that's, that's exactly right, actually. That's why right. you get full credit. So you just guess correctly. Because the thing is, for A, your friend's friend is you. Do you know where the mask on is? No, do you know where the mask on is? It comes right back to you. But the friend of a friend of B's can bring more novel information about predators or prey, can reach further into the network to bring back new information that the little cluster of A and all of his friends are in a little box, like a little echo chamber, telling each other, like the tea party, telling each other everything they want to hear. So, so they don't ever hear disconfirming information, right? Because so they only just are locked in there. Now, one of our first studies was to use a classic, one of our first studies going down the path of understanding the evolutionary biology and the genetics of human social interaction was to do a classic twin study design. Here we use data from Ad Health, a famous data set known as Adolescent Health that was collected by Peter Behrman and his colleagues. 100,000 uh, middle school and high school students followed for many years. Their networks were mapped. It was like at 120 different <coughs> schools. And in the data, there was also information about twins uh, and other kinds of social relationships. So this one I'm going to outline is a classic twin study design. And we introduced it earlier in the course when we talked about religion. And what we remember, what we said is that the way the twin study design works is, is that you, if I'm a dizygotic twin, so I'm a fraternal twin, I'm a same-sex dizygotic twin, so you take me and my brother, uh, and you look at my height, and you measure my brother's height, and you see how correlated our height is. And you do that for a whole stack of dizygotic pairs, and you see how correlated the height is between pairs of dizygotic twins, each twin. Then over here, you have a sample of monozygotic twins. And you see how for each index monozygotic twin, his or her height is correlated with his or her twin's height. And you do that for a whole stack of monozygotic twins. 
And you, if you see that the correlation of this trait amongst the monozygotic twins is higher than the correlation amongst the dizygotic twins, that gives you insight that probably it's the genetics of the twins that's contributing to this uh, difference. Because you assume that the environment in which monozygotic twins is raised is the same as the environment in which dizygotic twins are raised. There's a whole literature on twin studies, which I'm not going to debate right now. Um, but anyway, that's the gist of the intuition. So we applied that idea, and we looked at, we mapped the networks of monozygotic twins, and here's an illustration. This guy has one, two, three, four, five, six friends, and his twin has one, two, three, four, five, it looks like, friends. And then we can look at the, all the interactions among their friends, and the argument is, it was, that the monozygotic twins' networks were much more similar than the dizygotic twins' networks. So this pair of dizygotic twins, this guy has, has uh, you know, more friends, but his friends aren't friends with each other. And his twin has fewer friends, just a fewer, but those friends are friends with each other. So they differ in degree and in transitivity in this hypothetical example. And when we looked at these three traits, uh, what we found was the following. So on the, on the y-axis is the percent of the variance explained, or the heritability of the traits. And on the x-axis is the three traits. And what this says is that the number of friends you have, 47, 46% of the variation in how many friends people have, can be explained by their genes. Now this is not a shocking result. What I've basically told you is that some people are born shy, and some people are born gregarious. People vary in their taste for friendship, right? Some of us want many friends, some of us don't want so many friends, and that might be partially inborn. It's something to do with how you're raised, no doubt, and which culture you're in and everything else, but partially it also has to do with your genes. But in addition to finding that the number of friends that you have vary, we also found that some of those higher order properties that I introduced you to a moment ago also vary. So for example, we found that 47% of the variation in the transitivity of your friends also depended on your genes. Now this is one of the more surprising results to come out of my lab in the last few years. Because what I've just told you is that if you have Tom, Dick, and Harry in a room, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes or on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. Whether you two are friends with each other depends on my genes. How can that be? Any ideas? Yeah? Sitting next to uh, Ju Justin. Yeah? Yeah. What's your name? Joel. Joel. That's easy. Justin and Joel. Two J's. Uh, so uh, that's right. So people might vary in their tendency to introduce their friends to each other. So some of you, you know who you are, are compulsively like introducing your friends to each other and trying to force relationships. And others of you couldn't care less and kind of keep your friends apart from each other. And this tendency could also vary. We also found that 29% of the centrality could also be explained by your genes. So some people, uh, and the reason, the way we think this works is that people vary in whether they wish to have popular or unpopular friends. Okay, who among you wants to have popular friends? Raise your hands. You in the back there, you with the, with the red, yeah. Why do you want to have popular friends? Yeah, so you want popular friends because they're well connected and what's your name? What? Julia. Julia. So Julia wants to have popular friends because you can be more, more connected. Who wants unpopular friends? Oh, come on. Yes, you in the back. What's your name? Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Why do you want unpopular friends, Daniel? Uh, yes. So Daniel says, you know, I don't want popular friends because they all have no time for me. <laughs> Actually, Daniel's a very rational strategy. Uh, yeah, but, you know, but, but Julia, she wants popular friends, but she can never get their attention, but she has popular friends. Uh, and actually, there are other reasons. So people might vary in their, t in their taste for popular or unpopular friends. And if you want popular friends, you move more to the middle of the network. And if you want unpopular, and both are rational strategies for survival, by the way. So one of the arguments we're making is that natural selection can be acting on these phenotypes how many friends you want, whether you introduce your friends to each other, uh, whether you want popular friends uh, or not. So where you are in this vast fabric of humanity that we've been discussing for the last two lectures depends in part on your genes. But the, and the fundamental reality of our desire for connections and our susceptibility to influence, it turns out, has always been with us. Now, it's important to sort all this out. Because genes might be associated both with network topology and with behavioral outcomes. And so interpersonal effects might depend on both. 
So there are lots of labs around the country that are looking at genes, for example, in the dopamine or serotonin pathways, these are neurotransmitters, and how they affect all kinds of behaviors. Many of you are doing research in labs at Yale that look at this type of stuff. So how do these genes and these pathways affect behaviors like obesity, smoking, happiness, voting behavior people look at, or altruistic behavior, right? What are the sort of neurobiological and genetic determinants of behavior of different kinds? Last week, we showed you that the social networks could play a role in whether people evince these behaviors. And today, I showed you that genes may play a role in the structure of social networks. So this raises the possibility that there could be a backdoor path between genes and behaviors that goes outside your body, that's not physiological or psychological, but rather sociological. Maybe what makes you happy is not what the serotonin is doing in your brain, Maybe what makes you happy is how the serotonin affects which friends you pick, and whether you want popular or unpopular friends. And in that, affecting your external behavior feeds back on and contributes to the behaviors that you see. And actually, scientists who are then only looking at the top path are not only misunderstanding the phenomenon that's actually in the natural world, but also overestimating the importance of genes, Misund misunderstanding what the genes are doing, because only focusing on what they're doing inside your body not also what they're doing outside your body. So in fact, maybe one of the ways that our genes affect our behaviors is precisely by inducing changes in our social network structure. Now this idea, in turn, raises still further questions about why networks might be genetically encoded. And we think, in, in my lab and in James's lab, we think that part of this must be because networks enhance our fitness. And here I mean our Darwinian fitness. And more recent work of ours has shown that there are correlated genotypes in friendship networks. That is, that there are genetic consequences as well as genetic antecedents to the friends that we pick, and that this itself may also have implications for natural selection. In other words, your ability to survive may not just depend on the genes within you and the phenotypes that you express, but your ability to survive may depend on the genes and phenotypes of your friends, who you pick, right? So if that's the case, then natural selection should have a lot to say, not only about whether you have friends or not, but about which friends you pick. And we all, most of you probably have a kind of intuitive understanding of this because you understand that ethnocentrism is a widely prevalent human trait. People prefer people that look like them or that are like them, the so-called in-group bias, right? It, it's everywhere. People want to be with people that, that are like themselves and we cultivate this kind of love of the people like ourselves, and here's the really sad part, hatred of people who are unlike ourselves. That tendency is very deeply rooted and actually relates to social networks and to the functioning of genes, we believe, uh, within your body. And one of the things that I'm hopeful about is that an understanding of this so-called in-group bias and the network determinants of it might begin to give us ways in which we can cultivate love of your own group without cultivating hatred of other groups, right? So they don't have to be two sides of the same, um, same coin. Nevertheless, the basic idea here is that there are very deep reasons that human beings prefer the company of people they resemble, that we are uh, actually uh, homophilous. Now, if it's the case, if it's the case that social networks have you know, these genetic antecedents and have evolutionary significance, it begs the question of whether human beings have always had networks of this type. So the experiment we would love to do would be to fly back 10,000 years to human beings that were alive during the Pleistocene and map the networks of those people. And if what I've shown you is true, what we should find is, is that those networks of those people should look just like our networks because our genes haven't changed that much in 10,000 years. They've changed some, believe me, but not that much. Now, of course, we can't do that. So what we decided to do instead was what we considered to be the next best thing, which is to map the social networks of a human population that lives like we did during the Pleistocene, namely the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania. There are only about 1,000 Hadza left, and they live just like we did during the Pleistocene. They hunt and they gather for their food. They sleep out under the stars. They have no material possessions to speak of. And every six weeks, they move around and forage for other uh, for, you know, food uh, in, uh, in the area where they are. And they live in a very, very traditional, very minimalistic uh, way. So in partnership with Corin Apicella, who was a postdoc of mine at the time, and Frank Marlowe, who was one of the world's leading ethnographers of the Hadza, 
we decided we were going to do this. And Corin spent the summer in, a, in an SUV driving around 3,000 square kilometers. And every time she found an adult Hadza, she would ask them who their friends are. And in order to facilitate that, what we did is, is we made a photographic census of all adult Hadza, a kind of Hadza Facebook. And we took the Facebook, the Hadza Facebook, into the field. And every time we found a Hadza respondent, we asked them in a variety of ways, who are your friends? And here's Horan uh, in the field getting people to look through the pictures and identify who their friends are. And we asked them to identify their friends in a couple of ways, because it turns out that actually figuring out who your friends are isn't so easy. I can ask you who your friends are, but that's not necessarily the best question to ask. And there are certain ways you can go about doing it. One of the typical ways we do in a, in, in a population like you guys would be is I would ask you, who do you spend free time with? That would be a really powerful marker of who your friends are. A second question would be, who do you discuss important or intimate matters with? That's another marker of who your friends are. Now, these are the so-called important, uh, the free time and uh, intimate matters questions, or important matters questions. Those are the standard kinds of questions we ask in Western modern populations. But with a Hans, it's a little bit more difficult to ask them, who do you spend your free time with? Because they have a ton of free time, and they're always together, and they're foraging. So that's not what we needed to do. So we came up with a couple of other ideas. One idea was, um, was to use uh, gifts. I'm sorry, one idea was to use camping. Uh, and so in this situation, we asked, and we called it the camping network, we asked them, with whom would you like to live after this camp? So these camps are not stable. There are about 30 people in the camp. Every six weeks they move. You're not stuck with living with the guys that are in your camp. You can ditch them and form a new camp with other people. And we asked them, who would you like to be in the camp with next time of the same gender? Because we didn't want people to identify potential sexual partners. And they could choose people who were in the current camp or in other camps. And they could choose up to 10 individuals. And that's one way we mapped the network. Another way, which we thought was kind of uh, inventive, is what we, was, was to map the network using gifts. Now, it turns out that the Hadza love honey. It occurs naturally in their diet. But it's really difficult and dangerous to get. You have to, they actually have a very symbiotic relationship with honey catcher bees, or honey find, honey guide bees, do, uh, not bees, honey guide birds. Do, do you guys know about this? It's a, it's a really weird symbiotic relationship between humans and birds, where the honey guide bird leads the human to where the honey uh, comb is, the, the beehive, and the human breaks open the beehive to get honey for himself, and then the bird can then eat the comb afterwards. So it's a you know, there are all kinds of symbiotic relationships in the natural world, but this is one between humans and birds. Um, they love honey, but it's really difficult to get honey. It's dangerous. You have to climb up the tree. Uh, you get stung like hell, but they love it. So what we did is we went to Costco, and we bought 2,000 honey sticks. <laughs> and, uh, and we took the honey sticks to, which was not easy to do, to transport these uh, to Tanzania, and we gave each respondent three honey sticks, and we said, you cannot keep these honey sticks for yourself. To whom would you like to give them anonymously? So they could pick their friends to whom to give honey. And that was the way the gift exchange was how we mapped uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, network in that way. Um, and, um, and so here's a sort of a three-dimensional kind of rendition of a, of a Hadza uh, network. Sort of, uh, you know, you can kind of get a sense of, uh, of what it's like if you look at it. Um, and in fact, what we found when we looked at it now I'm discovering. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. That's not the most, uh, most recent version of that video animation, but I think you guys can still survive. Um,
And what we did is, is we mapped the networks of the Hadza and we looked at uh, and how they might look like. So here's actually a two-dimensional, more brilliant uh, rendition rather than the kind of grainier three-dimensional rendition. This is the image I wanted to show you, but they both tell the same story. This is just easier to kind of visualize and get a sense of. So remember, we talked about the last time how you might take uh, networks and project them on this the network's a hyperdimensional object, and you might project it onto a two-dimensional plane, which is what this does. It squishes it down and, and visualizes it. And if you, if you look at this network, every dot's a Hadza, uh, and these are just among the women and who they would like to camp with next time. We also make the dot size and color proportional to how kind these people are. That's not the point that we talk right now. Uh, the yellow dots are the kinder people, the red dots are the meaner people. It turns out they're clustered, the kind of mean people. Uh, but, uh, but the main point is, is that visually, and as it turns out mathematically, this network looks just like the networks that I was showing you uh, yesterday and earlier today. Hadza networks look just like ours. Despite the fact that in the intervening 10,000 years, we've invented agriculture, we've invented cities, we've invented telephony, our networks are just like Hadza networks. So this modern, uh, all the modern technology that we have, that we use to interconnect with each other, whether it's Facebook or anything else, is grafted onto this ancient foundation of human social interaction and guided and constrained by it. You can't just invent a new medium and change human social uh, interactions. And in fact, using a variety of particular features, uh, sort of quantifying in a variety of ways using a variety of statistical techniques, many of the things that we see in modernized human networks, whether they are mapped with Facebook or telephony or in college dorms at places like Yale, all of those features are also present in the Hadza. They have the same degree distribution. That means the same distribution in the numbers of friends that they have. They evince the same tendency to homophily. They show geographic decay just like we do. So you know like how you know the people in your entryway and maybe a little of the people in the next entryway and then beyond that you have no idea who they are? Uh, well, that's sort of what the Hadza do. They know the people right next to them pretty well, further away, and then it decays with geographic distance. They have the same amount of transitivity or triadic closure that we do. They have this property of degree assortativity, which is that popular people tend to befriend other popular people and unpopular people, so, uh, so Daniel hangs out with Daniel, and Julia hangs out with Julia's, so uh, that, uh, that we do. And finally, they have the same amount of reciprocity. We had surveyed these, uh, the respondents anonymously, and we had said, you know, uh, is, they, I'd say that they would ask, the researchers would ask me, Nicholas, is Sam your friend? And I would say, yes, yeah, Sam's my friend. Later on, they would go to Sam, and they would say, who are your friends? Unbeknownst to me, Sam says I'm his friend. The probability that Sam and I reciprocate the nomination in the Hadza is the same as the probability that you guys would do that if I mapped uh, your network. And many of these features, these descriptive features that I just told you about human social networks, actually have functional significance in everything from the evolution of cooperation to the relative ease of the flow of information or germs. So here's a deep, a very subtle idea which I want you to think about for just a second because it illustrates a lot of things, and, um, which is the following. If, if you wanted to organize the airport network in this country, how would you organize it? Would you organize it so that you have flights from New Haven to uh, Albuquerque and from Albuquerque to El Paso, Texas, and from El Paso to you know, uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and from Bloomington, Indiana to uh, Burlington, Vermont, or would you have organized it so that you have hubs like Denver and Chicago and Washington and Atlanta, and the little airports would fly to the big airports, and then you could connect and fly somewhere else? What would you do? The latter, right? That's the system we have, a hub and, hope, hub and spoke system. In fact, the system that we have is a system in which unpopular airports are preferentially attached to popular airports, right? Now, the popular are also attached to each other. But we don't have too many connections, relatively speaking, between them. So if you fly into Chicago, yes, you can fly out to Denver and, and Atlanta, but most of the flights out of Chicago go to all these other smaller airports. Do you understand what I'm describing so far? This is known as disassortativity, okay? That the popular uh, airports are connected to the unpopular airports. That's true of the airport network, but it's not at all true of human networks. Why? Well, now imagine you were a bioterrorist. If you were a bioterrorist, and you could put a poison in one airport, what would happen in the next two time steps? You pick an airport at random. What if it's Chicago? What happens in the next time step? You, 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 let, like, you, know, you let pandemic flu go in O'Hare Airport. What happens the next day? 
Say this, Peacock. Raise your hands. Yeah. Yeah, all over the world. The next day, bang, it spreads everywhere. What happens if you release it in Twee uh, Airport here in New Haven? Hello? Has anyone ever even heard of this airport? <laughs> There's a little airport here in New Haven. Uh, and that would not be very strategic of you if you were a bioterrorist. However, if you were a bioterrorist and you released it in, in Tweed Airport, the next time step it would go to Philadelphia, where we have a flight to or something, and then after that it would go to the rest of the country, right? So in an airport, in, in, a, in a network in which, the, which is disassortative, epidemics can spread extremely rapidly. Does everyone understand the intuition? Because you take one step, you reach a hub, and the next step, you reach everyone. Now, human networks, social networks, are not like that. They're organized in a way which actually does not evince rapid epidemic spread. Because unpopular people are connected to unpopular people and popular people to popular people. So the structure of human networks <coughs> happens to be mathematically such as to confer upon the group some immunity to epidemic diseases. Do you see this idea? So it's not just the people, it's not just whether your immune system works that's important. And it's not even how many friendships they are in the graph. So there are 200 of you, and each of you have five friends, there are 1,000 friendships. How I organize those 1,000 friendships among you can confer upon you an epidemic resistance property or an epidemic susceptibility property. Same people, same number of ties, different organization gives the collective different properties. It's unbelievable to me, actually. This is the thing that obsesses me, understanding how this happens and why. Why, it's not a coincidence in my judgment, that the Hadza form networks that are assortative, and, and so do we. Similarly, transitivity has very big functional significance. I cultivated that intuition in you by asking you to think about hunting a mastodon, but actually, the challenge of human cooperation and social learning is very high. Actually, you gain a lot by collaborating with other individuals. So it shouldn't be surprising that our networks would be organized in a fashion that makes it possible for us to cooperate with each other in very particular ways. So social, and in fact, in a very real sense, I think that the spread of germs is the price we pay for the spread of information. I think we come near each other to learn from each other, to gain fitness advantages by having social networks. And in so doing, in coming near you, I expose myself to certain risks, like you might infect me with a pathogen, or you might be violent towards me. So the argument that we make is that across time, natural selection has, has acted on people's network formation properties to shape human interactions along lines that are optimal for uh, our survival. Now, as I've been already hinting, we are affected not just by what is flowing through networks, the actual structure of the network matters as well. Uh, here's just one example of how network structure might matter, which is distinct, and, and how it might matter in a way that's distinct from what's flowing through the networks, that's taken from some work by a colleague of mine, a sociologist at Kellogg School in Northwestern, uh, in Northeast, at Northwestern University, um, Brian Utsi. So Brian became, and I don't, I, I don't think I signed this paper uh, for, the, for the readings, uh, but we do discuss it in Connected. Brian became unaccountably interested in the success or failure of Broadway musicals. He just became really interested in why some Broadway musicals are a success and some are a failure. And he put together, in a very famous paper, a study of 326 Broadway musicals. And he looked at the Broadway musical production company, who the director was, and the musicians, and the singers, and the producers, and you know, the costume designers, and so forth. And he mapped the networks of the Broadway musical production company. And he computed something very similar to the transitivity that I introduced you to earlier, but it's about something the same, known as the density. So imagine that this, is, this little cartoon describes one Broadway musical production company, and this individual in the middle is connected to these five people. Among those five people, there are five times four divided by two, ten possible connections, but none of them exist. So this production company has 0% density. In this production company, four of the ties exist, so it has 40% density. And in this production company, all 10 of the ties exist, so that's 100% density. And then what he did is, is he plotted on the x-axis the density of the Broadway musical production company, and on the y-axis, he measured the success of the Broadway musicals in two ways, how much money they made and what fraction of the reviews were positive. And he found that if nobody knew each other from before, the show was a flop. And if everybody knew each other from before, the show was a flop. That optimal group performance was achieved 
when some people knew each other from before and some people did not. So if this team is going to work together effectively, it's like finding and killing a mastodon. You need some fresh people to come in with new information to help you find the mastodon and some people who can work together to go kill the mastodon. So optimal performance in this example is achieved in this way. But the key intellectual point here is, is that it's not what's spreading through the network so much that's relevant here. It's the actual topology of the network. It's the architecture of the ties that gives the group important properties, just like the epidemic resistance property I was discussing a moment ago. A group of people, according to how they're connected to each other, can acquire certain particular properties. And this can be contrasted with the example that was in the readings from Peter Behrman's work on adolescent girls and suicide. Now, in that paper, what Behrman did is, is he maps the same quantity. He asks, do these young women in Ad Health, in the data set that I discussed earlier, look at their friends? So I take you, and I look at your two female friends. And I ask, do your two female friends, are they friends with each other, or are they not? Right? If they're friends with each other, you've got transitive closure. If they're not friends with each other, they don't. And I say, how does whether your friends are connected, how does it affect your probability of thinking of killing yourself? So suicidal ideation. And what Behrman finds is, is that to the extent that your friends are not connected to each other, as, or to the arc, so as density rises, Behrman finds that suicidal ideation monotonically declines. So the idea is that if you two can't get along, I'm just going to kill myself, right? Versus if you guys get along, everything is happy, and it decreases the propensity of suicidal ideation. In the Behrman study, it's not a parabolic relationship. It's a monotonically declining relationship between suicidal ideation on the y-axis and, uh, and density on the x-axis. We've also begun to study, and we talk a little bit about it, in connected networks of doctors. And to do this, we've used the metric of shared patients. So how can we now take network science in completely new ways if we're trying to understand the health of the public? So here's an example. These four doctors are taking care of these patients here. So Dr. 1 sees patients A, B, C, D, and E, and Dr. 2 sees patients B, D, F, and G, and so forth. You can take this so-called bipartite network, and you can project it onto a so-called unipartite uh, framework. And now you can say, OK, well, Dr. 1 shares two patients in common with Dr. 2. Dr. 2 and 4 share one patient in common. 1 and 3 share no patients in common, and so forth and so on. And then you can use big data, large data sets from insurers, for instance, and map the networks of doctors in this country. See which doctors are connected to which doctors based on their sharing of patients. And when you do that, you get images that look like this. So every dot is a doctor, and the lines between them represent relationships between the doctors where they share patients in common. Here they might have to have at least 10 patients in common for us to draw a line between them. And now we color the dots according to the specialty of the doctor. So the red dots are primary care physicians, and the other colored dots are specialists. And if you look at this image, you see that the, uh, that the uh, Pulp Fiction fans, the specialists, are in the middle. That structurally, the nodes with higher centrality in this particular hospital, so this is a hospital in upstate New York that has about uh, 300 beds, you see that the doctors and specialists occupy the central position in this hospital. If you're a patient that's admitted to this hospital and you die, in this hospital, you'll typically spend 48 days prior to death in the hospital and consume uh, $104,000 uh, over the two years before the end of your life. If, on the other hand, you were admitted to this hospital, also 300-bed hospital in New York, whereas here, the primary care doctors are now in the center of the network, patients admitted to hospitals with this doctor structure get a completely different kind of care. Here, patients might only spend 25 days, half as many days in the hospital, and consume only $46,000 in the last two years of life. So the argument here is that the structure of the network of the doctors, above and beyond who the doctors are themselves, and above and beyond who the patients are, that structure of the network affects the kind of care that's delivered in that hospital and that's experienced by those patients. Structure matters. Or you could map the networks like this and begin to look at how innovations diffuse through the networks. So here's a new anti-diabetic drug called Genuvia. And the question is, well, does this adoption of this new drug, is there a diffusion of innovation through the graph? Here we color the dots according to uh, how much Genuvia they prescribe. We make dot size proportional to the number of Genuvia prescriptions, uh, just like we did with the obesity example we introduced the last time. And we color the dots orange if they've ever used Genuvia, otherwise yellow. 
And once again, we see clusters of Danuvia prescribers and non-prescribers in the network, as if there are outbreaks of innovation, as if there are outbreaks of Danuvia uh, prescription in the network. Not only that, but we can maybe identify kind of, uh, kind of bottlenecks. Like this individual here opens up this peninsula, and he or she is not a Danuvia prescriber, even though all three of his major contacts are big prescribers. If we could change this guy's mind to adopt innovation, maybe he might open up the floodgates of information flow down that peninsula. So understanding the structure of interactions now gives us the opportunity to look at contagion of innovation and spreading processes uh, in the networks. Or we could look at hospitals, and we could map the network of hospitals in this country. So this is a map of about 5,000 hospitals in the country, and lines connect hospitals and patients move between the hospitals. You can visualize this and begin to study, OK, what if there were a bioterror attack now, not at an airport, but in a hospital, or a new pathogen, you're trying to control it. Who, raise your hands if you've seen Contagion. It's a great movie. Uh, and the only thing that's sort of slightly untruthful about Contagion is the speed with which they confront the epidemic. But otherwise, it's an extraordinary movie. So that's the kind of situation. How would the epidemic spread? We can understand it using uh, network science. So I want to close today, the last five or so minutes, with a kind of big argument in, from the social sciences shaping or continuing to shape your thinking about this topic. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, what's your name? Ike. Ike. Um, when we were talking about real networks and um, sort of optical and online networks and real networks, what, are, what were real interactions? What, how do you define a real interaction? So, that, so I would say the interactions have to be real or feel real. So uh, you know you can you can ask like do you actually know this person? So I could show you your Facebook. I suspect that if you have you know 800 Facebook friends and I showed you them, there are probably probably at least 50 that you actually wouldn't recognize, uh, and then be about uh, three or four hundred that you kind of dimly recognize, and three or four hundred that you know well, and then ten that you you really know. Um, and so you could you could ask ask people that, or you could ask them other kinds of questions about like well how close do you feel to this person? I mean, you've never met. I have one Facebook friend like that. We were, she's a sociologist at, uh, at Berkeley. I don't, I've never actually met her, but I feel like I know her. We were introduced by a common friend, and you know, I've been watching her child, her children grow up, and you know, over the last eight years. No, I mean, it's crazy. Another person like that is is uh, the woman who's the uh, press officer at uh, at uh, at UCSD, who I've never actually met, but like literally, I've seen her little girl from birth to like now age eight, and I really feel like I know this person. But that's you know, I, you could ask me. Am I answering your question? I guess you want like an actual metric for realness. Well, I mean, is, it, is it another way of saying it feels like it's an offline interaction? Okay. No, that would be one way, but that wouldn't necessarily be the only way. So for example, you could, if you play World of Warcraft or something like that, or if you ever did, you might really feel like you have a real connection to these anonymous individuals who you only know by handle, but you know their behavior, you've been collaborating with them for years, you know, you, you might feel you have a real connection with them. And I would count that as a real connection, actually. Other questions? I like it when you ask questions because typically it's not just you that has the question, and you guys ask good questions. When you have something you want to ask, typically there are at least a dozen or sometimes a hundred other kids who have the same question. Yeah, Leah. Can you describe again the difference between centrality and density? Yeah, so centrality is where you are. Are you in the middle of the network or are you on the edge of the network? And it can be quantified with that little betweenness example. Like, for instance, how many, intuitively it can be quantified by how popular your friends are. So a central person will have more popular friends. Or it can be quantified using that betweenness idea. So you're going to be, you're the kind of node that's on more paths through the network than a peripheral node is. Density is whether your friends are connected to each other, is how interconnected the little group around you is. So you could be a central node, I, don't, I may have an image somewhere, you could be a central node and not be very dense. Or you could be, they're ind roughly independent of each other. So social networks, to my way of thinking, offer a new way to understand human behavior and human society. One classic way of understanding collective human behavior is to examine the choices and actions of individuals. For example, we can see markets, elections, and riots as the mere byproducts of individuals' decisions to buy and sell goods, cast a ballot, or express anger. And the classic example of this approach, which is known as methodological individualism, an idea we've been discussing repeatedly in the class, is provided by Adam Smith's 18th century conception 
of markets as the simple sum of individuals' willingness to supply or demand a good. So Adam Smith says, let's focus on individuals, let's see what they want to do, and then we'll get other things that flow from that. But another classic way of understanding collective human behavior dispenses with individuals and focuses on groups that are exclusively delineated, say, by class or race, each of which is seen to have a collective identity that causes people in these groups to act somehow in concert. And some scholars in this tradition, such as Karl Marx, believe that groups have their own consciousness, imbuing them with an indivisible personality that cannot be deduced or understood merely from looking at the actions of individuals. This is the key tension between thinkers like Marx and thinkers like Smith, right? Marx says, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're part of the bourgeoisie, you have this trait. You have this feature, for example. And others have also focused on the primacy of group culture. For example, sociologist Emile Durkheim, that we've repeatedly been referring to in this class, argued that the relatively constant rates of suicide in different religious groups across time could not be explained by the actions of any individuals since groups have an enduring reality that long outlasted the lives of individual members. How was it, he wondered, that people came and went, but the suicide rate in French Protestants stayed the same? And this is known as methodological holism, and this approach sees social phenomena as having a totality that is distinct from the individual and a totality that cannot be understood merely by studying uh, individuals. Now, 20th century social scientists often focus on how the membership of individuals in groups via the sharing of particular traits or attributes could help explain their behavior or collective phenomena. So for the last 50 years or so, the focus has been on regression-based models that say, are you a white or black, educated or uneducated, rich or poor, urban or rural individual? Let's develop a little regression model, what's your sex? And we'll make a prediction based on your membership in those groups to how your behavior might be, and then kind of describe social phenomena in that way. But these two traditions, individualism and holism, shed some light on, human con on the human condition, but they missed something essential. And in contrast to both individualism and holism, the science of social networks offers an entirely new way of understanding human society, because it is about simultaneously about both individuals and groups. And it's about, indeed, how the former come to be the latter. Interconnections between people give rise to phenomena that are not present in individuals and that are not reducible to their solitary desires or actions. That's it for today. See you next time.